The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The proceeding. Order Marsha de Corva to move the motion. I'm not necessarily a long point of order, but I'm aware that my honourable friend has arrived in the chamber and we'll probably just take a moment or two to find her notes uh, and looking at her, I think she's done so now, so I will stop this pointless point of order. <laughs> well, gentlemen, the House of Commons. Marsha de Corva. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Mr McCabe, and it's, can I firstly start by uh, thanking my honourable friend uh, for his point of order. But I beg to move that this House has considered petition, um, e-petition 617603 relating to the state pension and retirement age, and it is indeed a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Um, and I want to start by congratulating Michael Thompson for creating the petition as well as the creators of the six other petitions that are also going to be debated today. I also want to thank Age UK and Silver Voice for their briefings and the Petitions Committee and the whole team there for all of their hard work. The petition calls on the government to increase the state pension to £380 a week and lower the retirement age back to 60. Now, already the pension... The, sorry, the petition has been signed by over 110,000 people. The current full state pension is £185.15 per week, and the basic state pension is at £141.85. Now, many of us here today um, are here because we believe that the state pension should provide adequate financial support for the 12 million pensioners in the UK, to ensure that they are protected in old age after paying in to the system. Now, given this country's wealth, we can afford to look after our pensioners. And by increasing the state pension or introducing a minimum pension income guarantee, thousands of pensioners could be lifted out of poverty. Now, whilst financial support, Mr Chair, is vital, it isn't just all about money. Measures to address pensioner poverty must include a broad range of actions to underwrite, except, um, <coughs> to underwrite acceptable living standards, including support for our wider public services, our social care support to our pensioners, and to, to live independently, and day centres to reduce loneliness and so, social isolation. Now, on this point, I would like to thank Age UK in Wandsworth, which is in my Battersea constituency, who I visited last week, where I met with many of their older people who value the services that are being provided by that day centre, um, but really wanted to have more access to it often. And more importantly, all of them wanted the state pension amount to increase. Now, Chair, poverty and inequality amongst pensioners is rising with over 2 million people in relative poverty. 
And there are many reasons why some are, fa are falling into poverty. And the first and the most urgent is the current cost of living crisis. And research by the Centre for Aging Better found that a further 200,000 elderly people have already been pushed into poverty in this last year. And a recent report by Age UK found that this Christmas will be among the most difficult ever seen for nearly 3 million older people. Now, this, the measly 3% rise in the state pension this financial year was dwarfed by inflation and the intersecting impacts of rocketing food, fuel and energy bills. Now, the latter alone is forecast to rise to £3,000 by next April. Now, after shamefully reneging on its triple lock manifesto commitment last year, the government did finally commit to its reinstatement, as well as a cost of living payment for pensioners in last month's autumn statement. But however, with neither scheduled to actually come into force until next year, the measures will be too little, too late for many who actually need that support right now. Now, the misery is compounded by cuts to public services and government U-turning on its social care reforms. Now, 10% of older people will reduce or stop their care in the coming months because of the cost of living crisis. Now, Chair, these causes of poverty only add um, to the challenges faced by pensioners, although Older people have higher rates of home ownership than the general population. Many are asset rich but are cash poor. And this means that some are driven to sell their homes to make up for shortfalls in pensions and pushing them into higher private rented sector. Now inequalities in the rates of the state pension are also dragging the elderly into poverty and the Department for Work and Pensions own statistics for the 2020 financial year showed that less than 10% of all pensioners were receiving the full new top rate of pension, which is the £180 figure, £85 figure I mentioned earlier. But even then, less than a third on the old pension receive its, it in its full rate. Now, the rise in the eligibility criteria for the state pension from 65 to 66 from 2018 has also heightened hardship with over 700,000 65-year-olds missing out on entitlement and postponing retirement. And this is according to the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Now, while compelled to remain in the job market, the elderly simultaneously lack opportunities to also increase their income. And I suppose that on that point, I would say that potentially the government need to consider looking at more targeted uh, support for people who are much older. As the endemic age discrimination in employment affects their ability to either build a work pension or find work to compensate for their state pension. Chair, the third factor is the pensions credit system, which can play an important part in helping to close that pensioner poverty gap, especially for women, for disabled people, and for some of our black, Asian, and ethnic minority pensioners. Now, since, in, since Labour introduced the measure, its efficacy has since been um, undermined by low take-up. And it's, it's a, in its report in July this year, the Work and Pension Select Committee stated that an estimated further 850,000 eligible households are not claiming pension credit worth 1.7 billion a year and it's strongly recommended that the government must improve identification of eligible people and streamlining the application process as well as making it more accessible. Now the risk of pensioner poverty is amplified for women the disabled people and our black, Asian and ethnic minority uh, pensioner groups. Women disproportionately experience later life poverty, suffering, um, suffering rises, rate, rising rates from 14 to 20% across an eight year period from 2013. And this is compared to 12 to 18% for men. And these figures are expressions 
of the wider inequalities that are endured by women. The Waspy Women campaign represents a particularly egregious instance of these disparities where the government has a legal and moral obligation to deliver for the many, many Waspy women in all of our constituencies. Now, Chair, the, the, you know, there is a particular impact um, in relation to uh, between pensions and lifetime earnings and the associated figures of the national insurance contributions, both of which are typically lower for women due to obviously the gender pay gap and also the caring um, responsibilities, all factors that everybody uh, will be aware of. Now, if I turn to our black, Asian and ethnic minority pensioners, I think these inequalities are even starker. So according to Age UK, 33% of Asian and 30% of black pensioners are in, po in, are in poverty, and that is double that to their white counterparts. And similarly to women, these inequalities are the expression of lower average wages, labour market discrimination, which in addition to... Um, translating into less generous state pensions. And this has often led to some ethnic minority people earning below the minimum salary threshold for the auto-enrolment into workplace pensions. Now, lowering this threshold offers an easy fix to this injustice and would double enrolment of ethnic minority employees according to the report that was carried, um, produced by the People's Pension. Now, employment and pay disparities also create later life poverty for disabled pensioners, meaning that they are less likely to possess a work and or private pension as a result. Now, we know that these effects will be exacerbated by higher living costs of around an average £600 per month for disabled people, which would include older people. Now, all of this emphatically emphasises some pensioners are really, really struggling. And the government needs to look at how it can stop, support them. So I do hope when the minister responds that she will address these issues that I've raised, but also make reference to the following points, because... The government do talk a lot about pension of poverty and tackling this. So if they are serious about tackling this poverty, why won't they commit to increasing um, the state pension or to actually introducing a minimum pension gar income guarantee for everybody, irrespective of their contributions record, their sex and gender, their age or their marital status? Now, in the current crisis... The additional cost of living payments that were announced last month in the autumn statement, they clearly won't be enough for some pensioners. So will the government introduce some additional targeted, so targeted at those pensioners that are most in need for financial support? Given the U-turn on um, social care um, reform, has the government carried out an impact assessment on that particular delay as to how that, is that, that delay is going to impact on our pensioners? Now, given the low percentage of people on the full new state pension rate, what plans does the government have to actually address that inequality that was highlighted uh, during my speech? And I think this is probably the most crucial one. It's on pension credit. Um, why won't the government actually deliver a, a take-up campaign to identify eligible pensioners and introduce that streamlined and accessible application process so that those pensioners that are entitled to this additional top-up income actually can receive it? I feel pension credit is an income that is there to top up, but I, I strongly believe the government could be really proactive in identifying those pensioners that potentially could qualify. Now on to the WASPy women. Uh, they need justice. So when will the government provide that compensation over the failings? And also, will they commit to ensuring that there is proper lengthy, uh, a proper lengthy notice period for any future change in relation to the state pension age? 
Now, on the workplace um, uh, enrolment scheme, um, will the government seek to bring down the minimum salary for auto um, enrolment um, to increase the participation of um, underrepresented groups, particularly our black, Asian and ethnic minority um, communities? As we all know, given the time of year as well, uh, loneliness and social isolation are key contributors of material deprivation and more investment is needed in public service and social support networks available that are available to um, older people. In fact, I think we need an overarching strategy that will address that. But what is the government doing uh, to support, you know, community and local organisations like Age UK Wandsworth in my constituency who they are actually providing a lifeline and providing vital services to the people that live in that local area. And as I alluded to earlier, and I will reiterate the point again, due to funding, many can only attend this centre a couple of days a week, but they would like to be able to go, you know, three or four times a week. It's unfair that, you know, they're, they're kind of being limited in terms of the, the, the time that they can spend at these centres. And I suppose finally... Um, uh, Chair, I want to kind of end by calling on the government to explore alternative ways to fund our pension system. Um, the state pension is underfunded, meaning that it is, um, its obligations aren't underpinned by assets, which could generate investment and return. And this funding model is implicitly appealed to when the government objects to rising, the rising cost of pensions due to our ageing population and the impact this will have on younger people, and um, that's probably none of us in this room because we're not all very young, but, um, well, some might be, but, however, you know, appreciation of um, other funding um, models used internationally can point to a systemic, systematic shift, maybe, in, in ways that could actually help fund a state pension system. So it's just about being um, progressive in our thinking and innovative in our approach, and as I believe, you know, we owe it to our elderly and to all of our pensioners, but also to the generations that will be coming behind us to look at all options that will ensure that when everybody reaches, um, you know, oh, their, their, their later life, let's just say, um, that they won't be fearing um, retirement, but they'll be embracing it because they know that there is a safety net, there is a state pension system that is there in place to support them, and they won't be struggling. I beg you. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 617603 relating to the state pension. We now move to backbench contributions. Beth Winter. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak as the question of how poverty and inequality affects older people's inclusion in society is something that I've conducted over 10 years of research on before becoming an MP, so it is a particular interest of, of mine. Um, so pension of poverty, as has already been said, is significant in the UK and continues to increase with estimates that over 2 million older people um, and that's one in five older people are living in relative poverty with the greatest impact on women and, and other vulnerable groups. And the level of pension of po poverty is actually similar in my country of Wales. And the Older People's Commissioner, and I'm very proud that Wales is, I think, still the only country uh, nation in, in the UK to have an Older People's Commissioner, along with other organisations, have expressed serious concern about the detrimental impact that the cost of living is having on older people. And the high levels of deaths from COVID in my constituency, we had the third highest death rate in the whole of the United Kingdom, really does exemplify the effects of poverty and the industrial legacy of Cannavale has on the health and well-being, uh, particularly among older people. Just before the summer, I conducted a cost of living survey in the Cannon Valley, and nearly nine out of ten pensioners responding said that they felt worse off than they did 12 months ago. And security in retirement came out as the biggest cause for concern among pensioners. And I'm just going to quote one older person who said, 
us elderly people have worked very hard over the years and we get very little back to survive on. And I just want to pay tribute to a range of organisations in Wales, including Age Cymru and in Cannon Valley, Age Connects, who are doing absolutely amazing work with older people, but also trying to empower and giving voice to older people in our communities. So moving to the petition, the petition today calls for an increase in state pension um, to £380 a week and a reduction of state pension age to 60. Now, this would be a significant change. However, the demands of the petition open up a debate on where pension levels are set and what is the right age to start receiving it. At the 2019 general election, my friend, the member for Hayes and Harlington, who was shadow chancellor at the time, sought a deal with state pension inequality for women and offered a major compensation scheme. And he was right to do that. He said, this is an entitlement, not a benefit. This is a historical injustice. We have to redress it. Over 4,000 women in my constituency of Cannon Valley are affected. Um, and I am working very closely with an active group of local women to continue campaigning for justice for the WASPI women. And I've continued to support their demand for compensation, both through demands for full restitution and the minimum compensation proposal of the WASPI campaign and the APPG. And as we know, the Ombudsman has found that there was maladministration, and we are now waiting um, for the full report to be published and the recommendations for remedy. We must compensate these women. And the other group um, of older people that I'm working closely with in the Cannon Valley are former minors. I welcome the Bayes uh, Committee's report back in 2021, which recommended giving 1.2 billion held in the investment reserves to former minors. And it really is regrettable that the government has rejected those recommendations, and I urge the government to look at them again. Both the WASPI women and former mine workers are examples of pensioners who have been let down, and let down massively by the UK government. More broadly is a debate around the level of state pension. Much is being said about um, how pensioners' incomes have been safeguarded compared to real changes to incomes and to social security in recent years. But pension poverty is actually growing, and this petition we are debating today demands a significant increase in the state pension. The National Pensioners Convention says state pensions should be set at 70% of the living wage and above the official poverty level at £242.55 a week. In other countries, such as the Netherlands, a pensioner gets that with an equivalent of over £250 a week. This petition demands £380 a week. And in Denmark, the folk pension for a single pensioner is £370 a week. This can and should be done. And these put the NPC and this, this petition's demand into perspective. They are not unreasonable demands. And the question about funding these increases is welcome. There are many sources of wealth and tax which could deliver revenues to pay for higher rates of tax. A wealth tax could um, raise in the region of 260 to 300 billion pounds. The country's got the money. It's a political choice not to redistribute the wealth of this country to ensure that older people and many other millions of vulnerable people have the necessary money to maintain a basic standard of living, which I think is a basic human right and everybody should have that entitlement. I also, just before I conclude, want to briefly take the opportunity to highlight the fact that over three quarters of a million pound, uh, sorry, people sorry, which represent a third of those who are entitled to pension credit do not claim this benefit, and it's a benefit that they are entitled to. And as my honourable friends already said, this equates to about £1.7 billion pounds of unclaimed um, money. I urge the UK Government to take urgent action on this, and I truly wish that the UK government would pay enough attention to ensuring that people claim what they're entitled to, as they do to stigmatising people on social security benefits who are entitled to that money and should have that as a matter of right. 
So to conclude, pensioner poverty is rising. And to combat that is a question of principle, of values, and to achieve justice, taking action to deliver it. Thank you, Chair. We now move to front bench, which are normally 10 minutes or less. David Linden. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Robert, it uh, is, as ever, a, a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and to apply to this debate on behalf of the Scottish National Party. I first also want to congratulate my honourable friend, the member for Battersea, on opening the debate and also to commend my honourable friend from Kinnam Valley for uh, the speech that she just gave. Um, before I begin the substance of my speech, I want to quickly note that my remarks here today are my first in my return to the SNP front bench, and in doing so, I want to pay tribute to the hard work and dedication of the Honourable Lady, the Member for Aberdeen North, who, as my uh, party's spokesperson for working pensions, repeatedly held the British government to account, fought for the poorest in society, and highlighted the sheer inadequacy of the UK's social security system. I know that my honourable friend will be a, a tough act to follow, um, and I wish her well in her new position as Cabinet Office spokesperson, a role that I'm sure she will uh, thrive in. Now, the petition which triggered this debate calls for an increase to the state pension and to reduce the state pension age to 60. Now, I'll come to the appalling financial inadequacies of the state pension in a moment, but I would first like to address the age at which people become eligible. Now, we are by no means outliers among developed nations in having an ageing population. This presents many problems for the state to solve in terms of service provision and fiscal challenges. And I think as we debate this, we should all, every one of us in this room, be mindful that not all jobs are the same. Certainly as we sit here in the luxurious comfort of a palace, for example, there are people out there carrying out manual labour jobs, some indeed today in sub-zero uh, conditions. And so, so, Robert, you and I uh, may not think that we would be ready to retire at 60, um, but of course many others will. And so I believe that a balance must be struck. And whilst the SNP cannot support a reduction to 60 in the retirement age for practical reasons, uh, this notion that the pension age needs to go up and up as a, a simple solution to the British government's problems is, I believe, both cruel and unrealistic. Now, in terms of the Department for Working Pensions, it feels like very little has actually changed since I was last shadowing this brief. The British government continues its heartless policies, the cost of living crisis ravages on, and it is the very poorest and most vulnerable uh, that brunt the, 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 the bear of that, that hardship. And as I was preparing for today's debate, I found myself uh, rather despairing, because Westminster, for me as a Scottish nationalist, often does feel like Groundhog Day, uh, but no more so then we look at the, the policies of the Department of Work and Pensions. And yes, the same Tory policies that I was criticising last year, I find myself here today critiquing yet again. But to, to me, it seems that the DWP's strategy to try and address the cost of living crisis is to largely shove their fingers in their ears and just hope that inflation comes down. And despite this, the cost of living crisis continues to spiral out of control. And inflation has risen to 11.1 per cent. That's a 41-year high. Essential family goods have risen sharply over the past year. And the Office of Budget Responsibility predicts that average household disposable incomes will fall by 7 per cent this year and next. Mr Sims, food banks like those in my constituency, such as at Glasgow North East Food Bank, are struggling to keep up with the rising demand. Around my constituency, I've heard food bank volunteers all across the constituency say that many people sadly are using food banks for the very first time. And one volunteer, eh, I was surprised to see, um, told me that a family who had previously donated to, to the food bank was now forced to use it themselves. And one of the things that I reflected on when I previously held this brief was that, you know, as politicians, we are... Um, used to talking about child poverty on a regular basis, but I think some of us find it um, a, a lot less natural, a lot more embarrassing. We wince a lot more when we talk about pensioner poverty. It's not something I think we give enough focus to. Um, but Independent Age have emphasised that, and I quote, with more than two million pensioners already living in poverty and the cost of living crisis hitting hard, we know that people are being forced to make impossible choices on how to cut back to be able to afford heating, electricity and food. 
And so, Robert, as Christmas approaches, research from Age UK has shown how frightened older people are about surviving the next few months, with significant numbers anticipating a, a more solitary and lonelier Christmas period than usual this year. Age UK's polling also found that more than one in five older people are already reducing or stopping spending on medications or specialist foods, or indeed they expect to do so in the coming months, and one in seven are skipping meals or expect to do so in the same period. Now, I know that the government, and I've got a lot of respect, uh, a genuine amount of respect for the Minister, I know that the government will say that the cost of living crisis is, is something that has come ar around as a result of Vladimir Putin's uh, invasion of Ukraine, but the cost of living crisis is not solely because of Putin's invasion of Ukraine, or indeed the economic hangover as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. I would certainly argue, for my part, and I'm sure others would as well, that the, the touch paper was lit on the cost of living crisis 12 years ago, when a government that Scotland did not vote for embarked upon a brutal assault via Tory austerity. And it has, I'm afraid, been exacerbated by Brexit, something else that people in Scotland did not consent to. Now, the UK has one of the lowest state pensions in northwestern Europe, and after a, a decade of Tory austerity cuts, pensioner poverty is now on the rise. And because 85% of Social Security and the state pension itself is reserved to this institution and the British government, Scotland, I'm afraid, has very little say on this hugely important policy area. And yes, SNP MPs have campaigned vehemently for the Tories to maintain the triple lock, only after multiple U-turns and breaking their manifesto pledge last year that the British government finally retain the triple, triple lock, but not after a very unhealthy dose of uncertainty for pensioners across these islands. However, the suspension of the triple lock in 2021 shows that Scotland does not have the powers uh, to prevent Tory cuts for pensioners. This suspension actually ended up costing each pensioner £520 on average during the cost of living crisis. Additionally, the Scottish Government under the current devolved settlement has no power to raise the state pension, as ministers know fine well, though some often like to pretend otherwise. You know, the SNP have continually implored ministers to devote a, a larger percentage of GDP to the state pensions and indeed to pensioner benefits. Additionally, the, the British government are allowing £1.7 billion of pension credit to go unclaimed uh, in the cost of life living crisis. Now, we know that Pensioner credit is a, a vital lifeline for many older people. However, only 7 in 10 of those eligible actually claim the money that they are fully entitled to. So I believe that the British government must introduce a, a full take-up strategy for reserve benefits, including pension credit, as the Scottish government has done uh, in respect of devolved benefits. And I, I welcome the, the conversation I had with the minister before the debate when we said that we would discuss that offline. And I, I genuinely welcome that. Now, the, the Conservative government has, I believe, a, a rather long track record in picking the pockets of our pensioners, from the waspy women to the triple lock, to the low take-up of pension credit, to the frozen pensions of overseas pensioners, many of whom are veterans, uh, including the scrapping of free TV licences for over 75. Um, the list goes on and on, and I think that this government is very much left wanting in terms of defending its record to pensioners. But it is only with the full powers of pensions that the Scottish Government can, I believe, remedy these injustices. In an independent Scotland, pensioners can be protected from Westminster austerity. And we in the SNP want to see Scotland being the best place to, to grow old, where retirement means dignity and fairness for all. And I know that adhering to manifestos or, in some cases, leadership election pledges is a, a bit of a quaint novelty um, for two of the, the biggest parties in this House. However, my party's 2019 manifesto committed myself and my colleagues to continue advocating for a fairer pension system and to oppose plans to increase the state pension age beyond 66. Alongside this, we would continue to call upon the British government to establish an independent saving and pension commission to ensure pension policies are fit for purpose and so, Robert, to, to genuinely reflect the demographic needs of different parts of these islands. I am very struck by the fact that life expectancy in, say, Kels uh, Kensington, Chelsea, is very different uh, to that in my own constituency of Glasgow East. Of course, all of this, though, is predicated in ministers in Whitehall listening to the voices of Scottish voters 
uh, who they send to this House, something that the government, I would argue, has a very poor track record on. And so I think that the only way to ensure that our pensioners grow old with dignity in retirement is for Scotland to become an independent country with the powers to protect pensioners and ensure that they live their final days in prosperity, not poverty. Thank you, Sir Robert, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Um, I would also like to thank my honourable friend, the member for Battersea, uh, for her work on this important issue, and indeed other honourable members who have spoken in the debate today. Uh, Sir Robert, above all, I would also like to thank the hundreds of thousands of people from across the country who signed the petition which led to this debate. The constituents who expressed their concern for older people uh, will now uh, have this issue debated, and it's right that we consider this matter today. Sir Robert, pensioners face the worst cost of living crisis for over 40 years. The cost of food's up, the cost of fuel is also up, and the cost of living as a whole is going up. And yet, at the same time, support for pensioners is actually failing to keep up with the severe pressure on these older people. Pensioners who have worked hard and contributed all their lives deserve to reserve a decent state pension in retirement. And as the official opposition, we support the triple lock and we've repeatedly called for the state pension to rise in line with the triple lock during the last two years. However, I'm afraid that the government's approach has fallen well short of what's expected by pensioners and what indeed the country as a whole would expect. I would like to, Sir Robert, if I may, set out uh, first the scale of the cost of living crisis and then move on to addressing the government's failure on this subject. Turning first to the scale of the crisis, it is clear that this is the worst squeeze on the incomes of families and pensioners since the 1970s. Inflation, sadly, has hit over 10%, something which is quite unheard of in living memory. However, the situation facing people on low and indeed on fixed incomes is particularly difficult. Pensioners and others on modest incomes spend more of their disposable incomes on food and fuel, which have increased to a far greater extent than other goods. Staples like bread, cereals, tea, meat, dairy produce and eggs have all risen rapidly. And some of these have increased by far more than the headline rate of 10%. The same is also true of energy, as is well known. Not only has the price of gas risen dramatically, so has the price of electricity and indeed heating oil. In the meantime, the government has dithered and delayed and put off addressing these important issues. So, Sir Robert, I would like to turn to the government's poor record and the lack of support and, indeed, delays to help poor pensioners. Turning first to the state pension and the government's failure to support the triple lock, um, despite raising the state pension in line with the triple lock being a manifesto pledge, ministers repeatedly failed to, to meet this commitment. Last year, the government used the excuse that earnings appeared to have grown by a larger amount due to the way that the return to work after furlough created the impression um, that earnings increased by 8%. Ministers used this as an excuse for disapplying the triple lock, stopping pensioners getting the rise in the state pension which they clearly deserved. We repeatedly challenged the government, but they simply wouldn't listen to the concerns which were raised. So, Robert, to make matters worse, this year, ministers refused for months to commit to increasing the state pension in line with inflation. Campaigners repeatedly pressed them on this issue, and we, as the official opposition, raised this matter in Parliament a number of times. As a result of the government's dither and delay, pensioners were left wondering what was going to happen to them at a time when they were facing a very difficult winter. Eventually, after months of delay and considerable pressure and stress on older people, ministers eventually confirmed that the state pension would rise in line with inflation at the autumn statement. Yet these failures and persistent delays let pensioners down badly, and I do hope the Minister will find time to apologise for this failure when she replies. So, Robert, I would also like to add that the government's also failed pensioners in a number of other matters which relate to the state pension, although aren't purely under its remit. For example, its failure both on pensions credit and some of the issues relating to its energy price guarantee, which has contained some problems. Time is pressing, but I would like to raise these related issues, as both policies should be offering far more help than they actually do at present. Turning first to pensions credit, the credit tops up the incomes of some of the most vulnerable pensioners who, are in who receive particularly modest income. However, around one million pensioners who are entitled to this credit are not claiming the benefit. So I would like to ask the Minister to explain why the Government is still failing on this matter and what more can be done 
to make sure that pensioners do indeed claim this benefit and to raise their incomes um, in line with what they, they deserve. Uh, turning to the government's failure on other matters, um, I would like to address the issue of the heating cost policy. While I note that help is now available, there are gaps in the scheme not least that the scheme will be scaled back next year. And also, in the meantime, for some pensions in rented accommodation, payments are not being passed on by some landlords. I do hope the Minister will address that point. I've had concerns raised in my own constituency of Reading East, and I'm sure other members from across the House have experienced the same issue. So again, I do hope she will be able to respond when she speaks. Uh, Sir Robert, time is pressing. I would like to once again thank those members of the public who signed the petition and also to thank my honourable friend, the member for Battersea, who's spoken so eloquently today, and indeed other members from across the House. And I look forward to hearing the Minister's reply. Thank you, Sir Robert. I now call the Minister, Laura Trott. Thank you, Sir Robert, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Um, I'd like to thank all honourable members for their valuable contributions to this debate, and the honourable member for Battersea for opening today. The government disagrees with this petition's proposed approach. The petition makes two suggestions to increase the state pension and to lower retirement age. I will first address the proposal to increase state pensions to £380 per week. Increasing state pensions to £380 a week would equate pension income with the national living wage in 2022-23. However, the national living wage and the state pension are two very different issues with distinct purposes. A direct comparison cannot be drawn between the levels of the two. The national living wage aims to protect low-income workers and to provide an incentive to work by ensuring that workers benefit from being employed. However, most pensioners have already left the labour market. Comparisons made in this petition between headline state pension amounts and the national living wage do not consider the full package of state measures available to support people in retirement and that pensioners do not pay national insurance or pay into a pension scheme through automatic enrolment. In addition, we need to be clear with the public. A state pension of £380 per week for every UK pensioner would be unaffordable. It would mean an annual cost of up to £251 billion if this was applied for 2022-23. This compares to the £110 billion we're currently forecast to spend on state pension. In the UK, we have a system of state and private pensions, which jointly provide an income for people in retirement. Most people will also have a private or occupational pension on top of the state pension. In the financial year 2021, average net income of all pensioners was £361 per week after housing costs. Crucially, the government also provides around £67 billion each year in tax relief to boost private retirement savings. And it's important to consider all aspects of government support for retirement rather than solely just the state pension amount. However, the, state, the government is committed to ensuring that state pension continues to provide the foundations for people's retirement income, and we're proud of the assistance we have given pensioners since 2010. Since 2010, the full yearly amount of the basic state pension has risen by over £2,300 in cash terms. That's £720 more than if it had been uprated by prices, and £570 more than if it had been uprated by earnings. As I think all honourable members here today recognise, the government has announced plans to apply the triple block this year, so from April, according to the normal parliamentary timetable, and indeed it was announced according to the normal parliamentary timetable, um, the state pension will be over £3,000 per year higher in cash terms, which is double what it was in 2010, £790 more than if it had been uprated by prices, and £945 more than if it had been uprated by earnings. Uh, now, pension credit has come up a lot today, as it should, Pension credit provides vital additional financial support by topping up state pay, uh, pension, state pension and other retirement incomes. Um, it is the minimum income guarantee that the Honourable Lady refers to. That is what we put in place to ensure that uh, pensioners do not fall below, below a certain base. Um, but also it acts as a gateway to other help, including assistance with rent, council tax, NHS prescriptions and heating bills. And, of course, of immediate importance right now, the additional cost of living payments that we are paying to those on qualifying means-tested benefits. Um, but there is obviously more that we need to do in terms of uh, linking this up with other information that the government has. Uh, and I will be pleased to work with honourable members, particularly the member for Glasgow East uh, and opposition members, in order to try and help make that happen. Um, but we have taken direct 
action when pensioners had needed it, both through the pandemic and now with the rising cost of living. Um, this includes the £650 cost of living payment paid in two instalments to help those on pension credit with rising cost of living. As we all know, and I'd like to emphasise again today, it's not too late for pensioners who aren't already getting pension credit to qualify for the second instalment. This is because a claim for pension credit can be backdated for up to three months, provided the entitlement conditions are met throughout that time. To ensure that a successful backdated claim falls within the qualifying period for the second cost of living payment, we are urging people to claim pension credit as soon as possible and by no later than the 18th of December. Of course. I wonder, I appreciate she will not necessarily have the, these figures to hand, but I wonder if she would be willing to, to write to me with some information about how much the government is spending on, for example, billboard campaigns and radio advertising in the same way it does, for example, the Leaven Up campaign eh, to encourage pensioners to take part. I would obviously be more than happy to do so. I know we spent £1.2 million over the summer. Uh, I've signed up uh, off a campaign for this winter with more coming after Christmas, but I will write to him with the exact amounts. Um, and actually that leads me nicely to the Honourable Lady who referred to a take-up campaign and we have had a huge um, take-up campaign over the summer. We've done one recently uh, as well and we have more, we have further communication plan. This is something that I am very focused on and I would like to work with all Honourable Members who are interested to ensure that that happens. Just on that point, will the of course. give way? Thank you, and I thank the for giving way. So just on the point about a take-up campaign. Is there any work being done to kind of measure the impact of the campaign? So the, the campaign over the summer, is any work being done to kind of identify how impactful that has been and how that has increased, has it increased any, any take up of pension credit? And going forward, yes, very happy to, to work with her on that. I thank the Honourable Lady for her interventions. We know that since the summer, claims for pension credit have tripled. So on average, we used to get 2,000 um, claims a week. That's gone up to 6,000. The difficulty with exact details on eligibility in the 7 out of 10 number that everybody uses comes from the Family Resources Survey. That was last done in 2019-20. Because of the pandemic, the survey has not been repeated and there's an 18 month delay in terms of the figures. So it's very difficult to get up to date data on actual eligibility levels, um, which is something that I think we do need to address over the longer term. Um, but in the interim, we have the numbers in terms of people that are making, making the claims to the line, which have gone up, as I said, threefold. Of course. Way. And I wonder if she uh, perhaps could, maybe she needs to write it to me and the other colleagues here today, perhaps she could explore the issue of pensioners who don't have English as their first language and other hard to reach groups who often government information struggles to reach. Um, and there, there have been uh, success stories in the past where particular um, approaches have worked with some minority groups. Perhaps she could write to us on that matter. Very happy to. And also, obviously, if the Honourable Gentleman has any specific approaches he thinks that we should be taking, I'm very open to any ideas that he has, so I would happily take those forward. Um, the £650 cost of living payment is one of a number of measures in the government's £337 billion cost of living support package, which ensures that the most vulnerable households will receive at least £1,200 this year. The package also includes a £400 reduction on energy bills for all domestic electricity customers over the coming months, plus a £150 council tax rebate for 85% of all UK households. In addition to the steps we've taken to address the cost of living for pensioners, we've also made long-term reforms to the state pension, and we've introduced automatic enrolment to um, boost private savings. In 2016, the government introduced the new state pension. This forms a clear foundation for individuals' private saving to provide the retirement they want. At the heart of its design, we sought to correct some historic unfairness in the previous system, in particular for women, self-employed people and lower-paid workers. Over 3 million women are set to receive an average of 